Good afternoon, Hollywood. Pardon the frog in my throat. I'm probably going to encounter it more than once during this. But it's everywhere and the show must go on. It's my contention that Elfendale is a true literary classic. I haven't got a century for that kind of confirmation. So, I'll do the best I can to prove it to you right here and right now. Welcome to Pitching Steven Spielberg 7. Elfendale excerpts. Three small chapters. They all are as they should be. These are from Berlin. What would be the third of the seven films of Elfendale. Chapter 6. Morgan's Apprenticeship. Although it took her a year to awaken to it, the two years Merlin deemed necessary to train Morgan to the full flowering of sorcery were as unnecessary as her flirtations. No exercises were required, no meditations, no poring over dusty tomes. Merlin saw from day one she was capable, at eighteen, of assuming his mantle forthwith, but he refrained from telling her this and teaching her the one spell she couldn't master without his assistance. He did so because he feared she might, in her youthful exuberance, do some small harm to the world, like interfering with the full flowering of Christianity, and because he wanted to enjoy her companionship for a while before entering his great rejuvenating sleep. Surprisingly, the impatience of her youth didn't wear on him, and the calmness of his age didn't wear on her. So those two years unfolded like a dream. But, like all dreams, no matter how pleasurable, their brief idyll soon came to an end, and he found himself, shortly after the passing of Arthur, teaching her that one last enchantment. By this time they were friends, comrades of the highest order. So when she uttered the fateful spell and made the sign that imprisoned him in his famous crystal cave, it wasn't in the spirit of betrayal, but in the spirit of compassion. Compassion for one of the grandest souls who ever lived. Compassion for a revered elder in need of a much-deserved rest. Chapter 7. Loneliness It would be inhuman to expect, <clears throat> despite the charm of their friendship, Morgan wouldn't, for a brief period at least, enjoy the limelight for a while after her enchantment of Merlin. After all, his was a very long and famous shadow to stand in indeed. She soon found herself, however, feeling neither fish nor fowl, as fairy increasingly faded from the world of man, Christianity having raised its sterner and sterner hand, till its presence, then visits from its denizens, became a rarity rather than the norm. Nymphs, the first to go, eventually stopped sporting altogether in the streams of earth, preferring the less tangible but safer waters of not here. Then dragons, griffins, fawns, satyrs, goblins, elves, trolls, nature spirits, and finally even unicorns bade a silent farewell, until their very existence was considered but base superstition. Alone in the world, and, paradoxically, in hiding for her life for having betrayed Merlin, the greatest of all pre-Christian men, Morgan committed a final act of pique before setting sail for Ireland. She befuddled the exact time and location of Camelot in the consciousness of all, and thus made it the stuff of legend evermore. No sad remnants of its foundation and flourishing would be found to tarnish its glory in the mind of man. No broken lance mounts, no pottery shards, no forlorn shoe buckles. Nothing would remain of Camelot down through the ages but a memory of its wondrous rise and fall. A memory man would take to the stars when he shook loose the bonds of gravity and voyaged out into the galaxy and beyond. A memory we all need. A memory that said, for a while at least, glory and justice existed side by side on earth, then faded as all things must. Chapter 8. Brenna This is tough, because I ain't good at dialect, even though it took me 13-odd years to tweak the dialect and the punctuation of Elfendale. In fact, that constituted 95% of the so-called editing. Chapter 8 Benno. One hot afternoon, in her 200th year of solitude, Morgan, strolling by a stream in a pretty Irish dell, happened upon a tall, raven-haired, milk-white, naked Celtic maid cursing to beat the band. 
She was doing so because her beautiful hair, thick and long by any standard, had been cleverly entwined in the branches of a rowan tree by a bunch of mischievous crows with nothing else to do while she napped in one of its forks. Her frustration at being unable to unravel it had led to an escalating anger, which, as is so often the case, had progressed to further entanglement, which in turn had resulted in fury, which tumbled her off the fork and left her dangling helplessly in an even greater rage. Now, when a person's in a rage, especially if their clothes are just out of reach, it's neither polite nor wise to laugh at them, but Morgan, having not enjoyed such an over a century, was unable to refrain from doing just that. Cut me down, ye bitch, shrieked Brenna. Cut me down, and we'll see who laughs the loudest after I've pummeled ye into a pile of sobs. Gladly, replied Merlin with an uncharitable chuckle. I could do with a tussle, and I won't even use me magic, should our little rollabout turn against me favor. And with that, she made a pass with her hand and uttered the spell of disentanglement, which sent Brenna tumbling to the ground in a fetching flail of frustration and surprise. In a flash, anger fled from Brenna as fast as her predicament, and she flowed erect in a grace that would bring jealousy to the breast of a tiger. Your name, she insisted, indifferent to her nakedness, as only the young can be. Your name, Morgan, boasted Morgan, Morgan Le Fay, master of Merlin and all of his arts. Right, affirmed Brenna, bursting into laughter. I'm convinced. Who wouldn't be? Just proof you're after, be it? snarled Morgan, offended. Very well. I'll turn ye into a frog. That way ye can hop up and down while ye mock the most dangerous woman ever lived. And with that, she made the sheep chain sign and uttered the spell. But to her bewilderment, nothing happened. How can that be? She thought, perplexed. How can that be? Ribbit, mocked Brennan, pretending to be a frog by hopping about on all fours. Ribbit, ribbit, ribbit. And then she fell over and rolled about in an absolute paroxysm of laughter. A snake, shouted Morgan, incensed and a wee bit uncertain of her powers for the first time in her life. I'll turn you into a snake. And with that, she made the sign and the sound, but to no effect once again, other than being forced to view the insulting sight of Brenna wriggling about in her belly, going, Slither, see? I'm slithering. Ha ha ha! Ha ha ha! It can't be, moaned Morgan aloud and in shock. It can't be. Only a pure soul be immune to me powers. Only honesty incarnate, and there's no such human. There has been. There will be. What can it mean? Have I lost it? Have I lost it all? And with that, for the first time in any of her lives that she could remember, she collapsed on the ground and blubbered like a child who'd lost its only ice cream nickel. Ah, emphasized Brenna, running over and rocking her in her arms. Don't be so sad. I can't bear to see heartbreak or so trivial matter as maidenly delusion. Let's be friends, shall we? Let's pretend ye be, Morgan. I really don't mind, just as long as we don't lie about it to anyone. I can't handle lying, you know. Even the thought of telling one has revolted me soul from birth. A lie? puzzled Morgan, recovering in spite of herself. Ye can't tell a lie? A human that ne'er lies? Is it possible? Can it be? Nothing difficult about it, replied Brenna. Tis easy as pie. Give it a try sometime. It really fills the lungs with air. That's why I can't spell ye, shouted Morgan, leaping up with joy. I haven't lost it. Ye really be unique, a truthful human. That's why me spells didn't work. I'm so relieved. I bet ye be, encouraged Brenna kindly. Let's fight us some supper. I'm starved. No need, laughed Morgan. I'll summon a trout from the stream. And with that, she made a sign and a sound, and a beautiful glistening trout leapt from the water, arced towards them in the sunlight, and landed at their feet with a plop, dead, if you'll excuse the platitude, as a mackerel, before it flopped or gasped for air. Who be ye? exclaimed Brenna, in shock. Morgan, replied her companion contentedly. Morgan Le Fay. Ten minutes is almost up. Seek me out, Hollywood. Hunt me down like a dog.